Okay, I, I see we've got a, a good group of people uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, webinar by the Johns Hopkins Science Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy, or ICEP. Uh, my name is Johannes Urpelainen. I'm a professor of energy resources and environment here at SAIS. I'm also the founding director of the Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy. If you are interested in learning more about our research, please take a look at our website. I have put the link in the chat box. It is size-icep.org. You can find our events, new publications, a blog, uh, and uh, lots of other stuff uh, there. Today, I am uh, delighted to moderate uh, this uh, session with my colleague, uh, Professor Jonas Nam, uh, on his uh, new book, uh, Collaborative Advantage, Forging Green Industries in the New Global Economy. Uh, Professor Nam is uh, one of the top experts on, on this uh, topic of green industrial policy in the world and uh, I'm also delighted uh, that he has agreed to lead the new ICEP green growth uh, program. So Professor Nam will be leading a very exciting uh, large research program on these topics uh, in the coming years, building on and expanding uh, the fantastic research that we are going to uh, learn about and discuss today. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask Professor Nam to uh, give his remarks. And um, after the remarks, we'll set aside some time for Q&A. Um, so please use the Q&A function for any questions. You can include your questions at any time. I will be keeping an eye on the Q&A box. And once Professor Nam is, uh, has finished his remarks, I will then moderate the discussion uh, between the Q&A box and, uh, and, and himself. But thanks again for joining us. It's really great to have all of you here. I think we're going to have a really exciting discussion today. With that, uh, Professor Nam, uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much for, for uh, organizing this, Johannes, for this very kind introduction, also for uh, aggressively promoting this online. So I, I am um, very grateful for that. I also should give a shout out. I see very strong representation from the library and the participants. So I. Uh, uh, I'm giving them like a, a thumbs up. Um, so I want to talk about my new book, which uh, just came out. I just recently received the first print uh, copies myself. Um, and it's a book really about China's rise in the global economy and China's sort of role in making renewable energy industries the industries that they are today. And so what I want to do uh, in the next 30 minutes or so is briefly talk about uh, the outcome that I'm trying to explain um, in this book, um, the sort of global division of, of labor and wind and solar industries that we see today and how we got to that division of labor. Um, then I'll make the argument about sort of what's driving this, uh, this division of labor. I'll go through two cases, Germany and China, as examples. There is a third case in the United States, which I'm more than happy to talk about in the q and I just don't have uh, time to get into all of them in, in this conversation. Um, and then I want to end by talking a little bit about the implications of this argument and this division of labor for climate policy today. COP26 is meeting at the moment. Um, U.S. tensions with China are, um, uh, are also there. And so what does this all mean for climate policy, um, sort of given this, this background? And so let me dive right in. Um, I started working on this project about 10 years ago, and I really wanted to understand back then why China was so rapidly dominating uh, these new these new industrial sectors, wind and solar, that uh, were becoming so critical to solving the climate crisis. And um, at the time, there was very much a sense that China was kind of uh, taking over these industries globally. In the US, um, President Obama at the time had declared the need to win the clean energy race against China. Um, but it seemed China was actually winning. So Lindra, a big Silicon Valley solar firm, had just declared bankruptcy and took down with it some $500 million in, in US government funding. Uh, so Lindra at the time was blaming Chinese competition and calls for trade barriers grew uh, in the US. In Germany, too, some high-profile solar and wind companies had gone bankrupt and, and raised concerns whether German firms and really the German economy with its strict labor laws and sort of ancient vocational training institutions and these traditional credit unions that made up the financial system could be competitive in the global economy against China, against these kinds of industrial giants. And so for Germany, this wasn't just a story about renewable energy industries, but really a question of whether this German way of life 
uh, was sustainable in, in this increasingly globalized international economy. And so when I started visiting um, China's wind and solar farms in industrial parks that all look very much like this picture, I was surprised to find that there was lots of collaboration between German, American and Chinese renewable energy companies. China's firms were um, indeed very competitive um, and they were focusing on the kind of in innovation required um, for mass production, the kinds of uh, R&D needed to bring new wind and solar technologies to market faster uh, at greater scale and at lower cost. But they were doing so on production equipment that was uh, developed and installed and maintained in China by German firms, small and medium sized family owned businesses often who had engineers running around these industrial parks in China working with Chinese partners to get that production equipment going. And many of the technologies, the components and the new materials that they were using in these products that were coming off Chinese uh, factory lines uh, were actually invented by American firms and then sold, licensed or even developed in collaboration with Chinese partners. One of the firms that I visited back then, Jay Solar, um, a Shanghai manufacturer of solar panels, had just released a new type of high efficiency solar cell and a key component to develop that technology was a so-called silicon ink a material that had been developed in collaboration with an american startup called Innova Light that in turn had gotten funding from the u.s government and from the national renewable energy lab here and in sort of a two-year collaboration they developed this this technology together with a chinese partner and then these products were being produced on a production line, a fully automated production line that was in turn contributed by a German partner, Schmidt, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And so instead of um, these kinds of beachheads in a global clean energy race, China's industrial parks were in, instead centers really of collaboration and a global division of labor. And within that division of labor, firms from each of these three economies focused on very distinct and in many ways complementary industrial specializations. German firms focused on what I call customization. Um, they produced uh, automation equipment, production equipment, very complex components, prototypes for, for new wind turbine technologies, and were generally small and medium-sized businesses. Chinese firms focused on uh, the kinds of R&D required to bring these technologies to scale through mass production. Again, a type of innovation, but one focused really on, on manufacturing and American firms focused on invention, the development of new technologies and often were startups with, with small uh, numbers of employees and no manufacturing skills at all. And this division of labor um, was surprising to me in many ways. Governments in all of these economies, uh, like Obama had proclaimed, were trying to win this clean energy race. Um, they were trying to attract and support full domestic wind and solar industries that were not reliant on global partners. Uh, and in part, there was a political logic behind this. At the time, wind and solar technologies were still more expensive than traditional uh, forms of energy, like coal and natural gas. And so governments around the world were giving a lot of public money to subsidize these new renewable energy markets and then in turn to justify these, these expenses were um, promising local manufacturing jobs and local industrial development as a result uh, of uh, support for such markets. And as a consequence, they actually converged on very similar kinds of industrial policies for these sectors, um, primarily combining support for R&D and sort of you know, research in that sense, uh, and support uh, for the creation of domestic markets. And that was the same very much in China, uh, Germany, and the US, in all of these cases, hoping that they would not just uh, create markets for these technologies, but also get the kinds of firms that would then produce them domestically and create uh, jobs that could justify these public expenses. And so while global investment in wind and solar grew rapidly as a result of these, these public policies, firms nonetheless responded with very distinct industrial specializations in, in each of these uh, countries. And so governments treated these sectors as engaged in a race, but the division of labor that emerged as a result of these policies was actually highly interdependent and very collaborative. The development of these distinct industrial specialties in these three countries was uh, very much in keeping with traditional strength uh, of these three different economies. 
But it was also surprising because wind and solar in many ways were the first really good post-globalization industries. Both of them became mature after the, the sort of wholesale reorganization of the global economy in the 1990s and China's um, access to the World Trade Organization in the 2000s. Um, and so we would have expected them to sort of start anew, start fresh. This was a different economy from the economy in which the global auto industry became mature. And yet um, what, what happened was that firms in each of these economies basically replicated these traditional industrial strengths. And they did so in ways that was, inter that was interdependent and complementary skills from each of these locations uh, were required to bring these new technologies to market. And so here for just a number of different sort of classic um, wind and solar technologies, you can see that there were partners from each of these locations that um, were required to uh, invent this technology, commercialize this technology, and then produce this technology, often in very close uh, interaction. And so this is sort of the core outcome that, that I'm trying to explain here, one that I think is puzzling, interesting, and is also very important if we think about um, what to do about the climate problem now and how to support these industries going forward. And I'll get to that at the end of this conversation. Um, so the central question then really is why did firms pick such distinct industrial specializations in the global economy in defiance of government policy and in defiance of these ambitions of policymakers that very much wanted to see all of these activities in the domestic economy. And the argument that I make in the book and I'm making here today uh, is that globalization itself is responsible for this persistent and, and kind of consequential divergence of these industrial specializations over time and the underpinning economic institutions that structure these domestic economies. And so in order to get to that argument, let us sort of take a step back and, and think about what globalization really means. And there's sort of three different views that are compatible in many ways, but that emphasize different aspects. And, if I can simplify it a bit, I think economists have often portrayed globalization as a process of really reaping gains from international trade based on a notion of uh, comparative advantage. Globalization from this perspective is a pro process of progressive outsourcing and this in many ways was uh, the concern of the Obama administration at the time. Would firms just outsource more and more of their activities to China? Uh, to a point where um, even core American strengths and innovation were being undermined by, uh, by this integration in the global economy. Political scientists have sort of looked at globalization slightly differently. They've often worried about uh, the consequences of competition in the global economy for doing things differently domestically. Globalization here is often seen as uh, a process of convergence that makes distinct national political economies increasingly unfeasible. Um, as nations liberalize their domestic institutions in order to remain competitive. And so this very much was the concern of the Germans at the time. Could their firms compete against Chinese competition in these industries, despite very high domestic manufacturing wages, very strict labor legislation, a financial sector that could not invest in the kinds of um, capital that, that China's banks were supplying to their wind and solar firms. And so was this German way of running the economy sustainable in the system? I want to highlight here really a third view of globalization, one that emphasizes these new opportunities for collaboration that have emerged as a result of this ever closer integration of the global economy, at least during that time. I think we're seeing a pushback now and I'll get to that. I'll get to that as well. Um, and so I really, in this book and, and you know, in this talk, see globalization as primarily a process of collaboration, one that has opened new ways of, uh, new opportunities for collaboration and new ways of working together. And so I use this term collaborative advantage that is the title of the book as shorthand for the process uh, through which firms insert themselves into these global supply chains and enter these new industries. And I argue that there, there are really two sets of advantages that firms derive from engaging in this, in this global economy. First, because of new opportunities for collaboration, uh, firms can participate in these new sectors uh, through specialization, and that's sort of the economic manifestation of collaborative advantage. They no longer have to do everything, but they can focus on narrow sets of specializations and then work with other firms uh, for things that they don't know how to do, kind of like the Chinese manufacturers knew how to do manufacturing, but they didn't really know, and domestic firms in China didn't really know how to make production equipment. 
And so in that sense, collaboration obviates the need to establish all the skills required to develop, commercialize, and produce new technologies, and instead allows firms to specialize in distinct steps in that path. And the second and related advantage then is that because of specialization, because it enables specialization, Globalization allows, fir allows firms to pick pathways into these new industries that allow them to build on existing skills. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can find specializations that are useful in these new industries, but that have a relationship with what they already know as firms, and also that build on and um, repurpose domestic institutions that already exist. And so in entering wind and solar for, uh, industries, for instance, German firms could uh, pick specializations that worked well with these existing labor laws, vocational training institutions, um, financial institutions, these credit unions in the German system. Chinese firms were able to enter wind and solar without knowing how to make manufacturing equipment, but they could specialize on uh, this kind of R&D related to mass production. And that was only possible because they were able to work with German firms and with American startups that sort of obviated the need for doing everything. And so by allowing firms to specialize and build on these existing skills and institutions, globalization itself enables this persistent and consequential uh, divergence of these industrial specializations over time. Instead of making us all the same, it actually allows us to be very different from one another because we can work with other people, other firms um, to make that difference sustainable over time. Let me give you an example. This is all very abstract, but um, one of the firms that I've visited frequently in this research over the last 10 years is this uh, German firm Team Technik, which uh, is a family owned business. It's an auto supplier that uh, originally was founded in the 70s and, and worked in the auto industry. Uh, in the early 2000s, they entered the solar industry by building on these existing skills they had in automation and added new skills uh, adopted from the medical industry. They learned how to use these lasers um, uh, for drilling and then uh, develop production equipment for the solar industry where, where these solar cells had to be perforated in a certain way. Um, and they were able to enter the solar industry because they found a Chinese partner that needed this kind of equipment. And so they worked with the Chinese partner um, to develop this technology, uh, this manufacturing equipment, and in the process relied on their local vocational training institutions, their local finance, financing institutions that were able to lend them money to do this kind of work. And so they reinvented themselves within these traditional skills that they had and made them applicable for a new industrial sector in order to, diversi uh, to diversify beyond uh, the auto industry. Um, more recently, I went back just before COVID uh, to visit them again, and they were sort of worried the solar industry wasn't doing so great at the time and it pulled up and they were in this gleaming new glass building. And it turns out they have since uh, reinvented themselves again and are now making production equipment for electric vehicle engines. And so they've used these German institutions that many were so worried were no longer suitable for a globalized economy to reinvent themselves over and over again for new clean energy industries. And so instead of undermining these traditional economic institutions, I show in the book that globalization really allows firms to reinvest in them and strengthen them and to become part of the political coalitions that keep these traditional institutions alive. And so in Germany, I focus on um, R&D institutions for collaborative research that um, are really focused on these small and medium sized businesses and the sort of traditional German econ economic core. Um, I focus on house banks and these traditional credit unions that are able and willing to provide small loans and patient capital to local firms. And I focus on a very unique German vocational training system of apprenticeships that uh, produces these very highly skilled manufacturing laborers that are not cheap, but they know how to do this customization work that I talked about previously. In China, instead, it's institutions for mass production that remain relevant in these industries. So large development banks that are willing to lend to manufacturing enterprises, uh, these big engineering schools, migrant labor and manufacturing training institutions, um, and the kind of institutions for mass productions that encourage manufacturing firms to invest in this kind of R&D related to mass production. And in the US, it's a very different set of technologies that is really focused on universities and the kind of spin off from universities into startup um, of federally funded research. And so these institutions were there way before wind and solar industries existed, 
But because of globalization and this collaboration among firms, they've retained relevance and, and value in these new sectors. And so it's quite the opposite of a race. It was because of collaboration that these traditional industrial specializations and their underlying economic institutions survived and became relevant in these new industries. Um, these legacy institutions in that sense gained value in wind and solar because they no longer had to support the full range of activities to invent and commercialize new technologies, but they could support very distinct steps in this in this trajectory. And so this divergence of these national patterns of industrialization, industrial specialization resulted from many, many, many aggregate firm decisions to renew and repurpose these institutions for new um, for application in these new industries. And so uh, that's sort of an abstract argument about globalization and how firms make decisions about uh, how to specialize and how to enter these new sectors and what kinds of institutions to bring with them. And so let me talk through uh, this process in, in the German case and the, the Chinese case. And then uh, in the Q&A, we can have a conversation about maybe what, uh, what to do about the United States. And so, as I said before, Germany really specialized in what I call customization. So these are small firms. They're often located in towns like the one on this picture. So this is not sort of these large industrial parks that I showed you in China. Um, they're often family owned, um, many generations old, uh, and they are really specialized on sort of making um, these highly customized uh, products that often have very small production runs. They make maybe 30 or 50 of the same thing, not 50,000 or 50 million, like you would see in a Chinese case. Um, and so this specialization and customization um, is focused on often automation equipment, production equipment, um, prototyping for new kinds of components when a new technology comes out. So a new type of wind turbine, for instance, an offshore or a bigger wind turbine that needs um, a prototype uh, for a component. And it's making use of these institutions for collaborative research, these house banks, the vocational training system that, that has long kind of dominated this industrial core of the German economy. Germany, as I said, originally also combined these technology push and market pull um, industrial policies for these sectors. That, kind of funded renewable energy research since the oil crisis basically um, and then started in the early 1990s to really heavily subsidize uh, domestic markets for wind and solar initially wind and then solar um, starting in the early 2000s and the hope uh, maybe not in the early 1990s when you couldn't really foresee what the development in these industries was but at least in the late 1990s the hope was that this would cause the development of domestic industries that would produce these uh, these wind and solar technologies and so i think politicians very much thought about manufacturing mass production of wind, wind and solar technologies but instead the kinds of firms that entered wind and solar uh, industries in germany were primarily suppliers of components and production equipment um, in the wind industry, it was over 90% of the firms were, were component suppliers and the solar industry it was close to 90%. And so these manufacturing firms that directly competed with China were actually a small in number. The large majority of firms were firms that actually could sell things to Chinese partners and work with them. And so an example of this uh, is this Schmidt group that I mentioned. Um, at the beginning of the talk, uh, again, kind of a classic family-owned business founded in the 1800s as a foundry. It then started making saws for lumber mills in the 1920s, made manufacturing equipment for furniture. Uh, in the 1960s, when semiconductors became a thing and started printing electronic, uh, making printers for electronic circuit boards, and then entered the solar industry in the early 2000s, sort of again and again kind of building on these skills it already had um, and kind of adapting them for application in new industrial sectors. Uh, in 2008, they uh, developed this first selective emitter process that uh, eventually they also worked on with JA Solar. Um, they then held the efficiency record for monocrystalline solar cells based on the production equipment that they had built uh, and were involved in bringing this technology with the Nova Light to the market that uh, I mentioned at the very beginning. And so it's clear from this example that these uh, firms and what we call the Mittelstand in Germany, these sort of small, medium sized firms, very much relied on Chinese partners to make that industrial specialization feasible. They were not going to be uh, 
solar manufacturers, there was no institutional support for the kind of production scale that would have been required, the kind of financing that would have been required, or even the training required for this. Instead, Chinese partners kind of complemented these German manufacturers, which remain focused on their niche uh, specialization. The Chinese firms also provided incentive to develop these technologies because there was lots of demand for them in China. Um, and, and one of the reasons was that China in the early 2000s was the first country globally to really fully automate production. Labor turnover in China was so high that firms couldn't keep up with training. And so they were really strongly incentivized to automate production. And that was exactly what the German firms could help them do. And so instead of competing with China, what we see is that Germany is actually increasing its exports to China in the solar sector here very exponentially over time. And that is because they're shipping production equipment to Chinese factories to make solar panels uh, in China. And in doing so, these firms relied exactly on the kinds of resources for manufacturing that many in, many in Germany at the time thought were going to wither away in globalization and were sort of no longer sources of competitiveness. So this is the German apprenticeship system, this kind of vocational training system that, that, that um, educates workers to do exactly this kind of work, um, but also the sort of financing institutions, these bank loans and the heavy reliance on equity uh, that many thought was um, no longer kind of with the times. And, and, and yet it was precisely these long relationships with local banks that allowed firms to um, invest in, in kind of retooling their, their plans and, and getting into solar industries um, with, uh, and, and wind industries with the trust of their local bankers that were willing to fund it. And so in China, we sort of see the flip side of this coin, right? So we have these large industrial parks, we have a focus on mass production, not just on sort of cheap mass production, but on the innovation required for mass production. Um, and we have institutions that support this in terms of um, development banks, land and land um, grants, tax breaks for production, local engineering schools, and so on, um, that were not really designed for innovation either, but that were repurposed by these firms for this kind of manufacturing innovation that I outlined. In China, maybe more so than in these other places, um, the technology push and the kind of market pull policies really focused on technological independence. The central government in China for the longest time, at least since 2006, when this indigenous innovation initiative came about, um, wanted to become technologically independent from foreign partners. So they did not really appreciate these collaborations, but um, firms did not uh, develop all the skills required to domestically commercialize these technologies. And instead, um, they focused on what I call in this book, innovative manufacturing, the kind of engineering and design capabilities at this intersection of manufacturing and traditional R&D. Um, engineering capabilities that allow these firms to simultaneously manage tempo, volume, and cost in the in the scaling up of new technologies and so in many ways these r and teams that i encountered in chinese factories over and over again don't look so different from the sort of stereotypical r d team that we would expect elsewhere but they're just focused not on inventing new technologies but on taking existing technologies and then bringing them to mass production uh, more quickly and the reason they did that in many ways was because you could license technologies very easily in the global market. There were engineering firms in Europe that would sell you a license for a wind turbine um, sort of technology. Um, solar PV technologies were pretty much well known um, around the world. They were sort of based on physical principles, so there was no copyright to be infringed there. They were available. Lots of the Founders of Chinese manufacturing firms came back from Australia where they had studied um, in solar PV labs and sort of learned the, the technology behind it. What no one had really figured out was the mass production. These were cottage industries at the time with very small production runs. And so counter to this narrative that China somehow stole uh, wind and solar manufacturing from elsewhere in the world, it was really that China invented mass production in these sectors because no one else had done it. And they saw this sort of unique niche and, and need for their skills in this space. And so they did this while uh, never breaking up with their foreign partners. And so you see this in this example of Goldwind, one of the big and early Chinese manufacturers um, uh, of wind turbines. They were successful in almost every government uh, research grant, sort of this is applied research program um, round for different kinds of wind turbine technologies that 
in principle was supposed to make these Chinese firms independent of foreign partners, but instead they developed these technologies over and over again with foreign partners, either through licensing or through joint development agreements. And so they brought their skills to the table while also relying on other firms to bring, um, bring other skills to the table. And in doing so, they really repurposed these manufacturing institutions at the local level in China that were not really set up for innovation, uh, but they repurposed them to do precisely this kind of innovation. I think the biggest one here um, is the ability for local governments to broker these big financial deals and, and loans from state-owned development banks for wind and solar firms at the time, which allowed them to build designated manufacturing plants just for research and development. And so one of the key problems usually is that you have to compete with production if you want to test out a new process in manufacturing. And so to the very envy of all the German inter engineers that I interviewed, the Chinese firms had designated production lines that were just for research and development as a result of being able to raise this kind of money. And you can see that they were able to do so even after the financial crisis. Um, if you look at their, um, this is just a, a table of sort of their, their bank loans that they took um, through these deals. And you can see that they were able to do that even after the financial crisis in 2009 when financing dried up pretty much elsewhere in the world. And so what we have as a result of this are these incredible um, cost declines uh, because of collaboration with China, but not just because of China, because of this collaboration between firms from all over the world. I'm focusing here on German, American and Chinese ones, but other ones were of course involved uh, as well. And so where does this leave us, this division of labor that is both very anchored in these traditional domestic institutions that's highly interdependent and that's also been very stable over time. So I said I started this work 10 years ago. I've been going back to these firms ever since. I was there uh, until a week before COVID sort of shut down China uh, last year. And so I've sort of followed these relationships over time and they've been remarkably stable. They've been working on new technologies every year, but it's kind of the same partners that still uh, work together. Um, what do we make of this sort of um, this idea that uh, specialization that enables or that collaboration enables this kind of specialization and that specialization then enables firms to pick these um, kinds of skills that uh, repurpose and, and sort of jibe with existing strength in the domestic economy. Um, one argument that I make in the book, of course, and then that I make here is that sort of globalization is something to be appreciated, but it's not making us all the same, that we can live very different domestic economic lives in different parts of the world, and that those are actually sustainable because of globalization and not threatened. But if the last year has taught us anything, there's a new debate about whether it might be globalization itself that needs to be protected. Um, the pandemic has exposed these supply chain vulnerabilities globally. There's been a political backlash against globalization, I think, as a result of, of the pandemic. Um, but there's also real economic consequences um, as a result of these supply chain issues that we're facing at the moment. And so what does this mean for a division of labor in which we are so highly interdependent? For one, it means, and I think this is important since we're currently uh, dealing with uh, COP26, for one, that means that in the short run, global climate goals will require continued collaboration with China. China produces 66% of the world's solar panels. It makes more than a third of the supply of wind turbines. If you look at the components that go into wind turbines around the world, China's share is probably um, north of 50 percent it's the largest supplier often market for electric vehicles it makes two-thirds of the world's lithium iron batteries which we need for storage we need for electric cars and so in the short run we cannot really break up this division of labor without, without also jeopardizing our climate goals. If we want to decarbonize the electricity sector by 2035, as the Biden administration has declared and is sort of struggling to get get on paper um, it'll entail buying a lot of things from China that have resulted as uh, or come about as a result of such collaboration and we're seeing a similar development um, a similar division of labor in this uh, lithium iron battery production which uh, now also has uh, german firms supplying production equipment american firms licensing new kinds of battery chemistries to chinese firms and then chinese manufacturers sort of becoming the nodes that bring it all together get a lot of money from local banks and then build large-scale uh, production capacity. So this is uh, repeating itself over time. 
His dependence on China, especially as sort of trade relationships with China are a little difficult at the moment and the relationship is certainly deteriorating, um, doesn't mean we have to live with this division of labor forever. I don't think that this is a uh, given. And so I think we can try over time to shift this division of labor and really interesting um, uh, proposal, like it didn't make it into the final bill, but that was debated as part of the reconciliation bill in the US this summer was uh, a proposal to establish a domestic manufacturing bank in the US that would lend to small and medium sized American manufacturers so that they could enter new industries and particularly critical industries like clean energy. Um, the bill didn't make it, but it was sort of the first real industrial policy attempt to not just blame China for being so dominant in manufacturing, but actually trying to create new institutions domestically that could support different kinds of activities here. So I think this is promising, even if it's just an idea at the moment, um, but promising that Washington is now sort of waking up to the fact that if you want to change this division of labor, you actually have to do the work to do that and you can't just blame China for it. And so maybe what we should do, and I'll conclude with this slide, is to focus on what I call conscious collaboration. I think in the short run, there are a few alternatives to working with China on the commercialization and deployment of clean energy technologies um, to meet our climate goals. But it, um, it's not a zero-sum game. I think there are opportunities for intervention domestically here to increase the benefits for American firms and help them uh, get a bigger, bigger slice of the pie. There are also long-term opportunities to improve the domestic support, the kind of competitiveness of domestic manufacturing in the U.S. if that's what we are concerned about, if we want to do more of it. And then finally, I think we should also think about collaboration with China as an opportunity for learning, because if we really want to become better at manufacturing and shift the division of labor domestically uh, to get more of that here, the one place we can really learn from is China, because that's the one thing that they have perfected. And so um, that means that for the foreseeable future, I think decoupling from China is a terrible idea, both because it would shut down these learning opportunities, it would break apart these division uh, these collaborative agreements between different firms that have made wind and solar technologies cost competitive in many parts of the world um, and it would jeopardize our climate goals at a time when everyone's telling us we have four or five years to peak global emissions and then have to start rapidly declining uh, our emissions output in order to meet climate goals and so with that i'm going to stop thank you all for coming and for listening uh, excellent uh, that was quite a quite a tour of the of the uh, clean technology world. A very, very interesting, interesting discussion. So we do have uh, quite a few um, questions and comments um, here. Uh, so first of all, just to note to everybody, a uh, logistical uh, question from Florence about um, uh, the recording. So yes, the recording will be available. Uh, it will be emailed to all of the uh, RSVPs and it will also be available on our website. So you, you can uh, uh, share it with, with anybody who's interested in this um, topic. Okay, um, now we have, a, I think, a very um, specific uh, question from uh, Tan Mei Nag. Uh, is that a U.S. Department of Energy on uh, gearless uh, turbines? Um, I know it is. Um, I'm, so the example I gave was actually for um, a solar company for the silicon ink development so i'm not sure if that was um if that was what this person was referring to but it was essentially um doe funding actually for the silicon ink which could have had application on all sorts of things you can use it in lcd, LCD screens you could use it as solar panel uh, solar panel component and so this firm was trying to become a manufacturer in the us domestically but couldn't find the kind of funding required to build a manufacturing plant and just before they went out of business they found this chinese partner um, then jointly sort of figured out how to actually integrate this technology into new kinds of solar cell technologies. And then we're so successful in supplying the Chinese market with this thing that DuPont Chemical bought them. Uh, and so they were one of these sort of success stories in the American case that really made use of this division of labor with, with, with China. Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you. Next, I uh, have a question from uh, one of our uh, alumni, uh, Wei Lai was asking about uh, liquefied natural gas, so LNG. So any thoughts on US exports of LNG to China and uh, Germany? Uh, that's like a, that's a whole different cup of tea, I guess, right? So, um, and I, I guess sort of, 
that would really be sort of a political problem. I mean, will, does the U.S. want to export? Do other countries want to import? Do we have the infrastructure to do so? Um, I think the politics here is slightly different because it's not so much about kind of tech collaboration and developing new kinds of um, new kinds of technologies. But I certainly think that there is um, concern now about this kind of interdependence, right? So, so I think if COVID has taught us anything is that people are kind of reluctant to enter these kinds of agreements. Um, the Europeans are being squeezed by Russia. Um, so I think, you know, I think that that's politically difficult, difficult to do at the moment. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Next, I have uh, our friend uh, Jeff Colgan is, uh, uh, has a Hi, uh, uh, question. So um, one thing we see in other global supply chains is that some actors like Apple are able to call the shots and extract a disproportionate share of the value from the product, leaving only minimal profits to other players like iPhone component manufacturers. So uh, who has the power and who captures the value in this kind of US, German, Chinese uh, value chain for solar and wind? That's a really interesting question. So, so the one difference that I will say between something like Apple and wind and solar is that this is not a consumer product, right? And so Apple gains so much power and has so much value capture in these um, relationships because it's basically the, the branding agent that can market to people like me that they need an iPhone every two years. And so I fall for this stuff and buy new things even though I don't need them. Um, I think that's where a lot of the sort of value creation from Apple comes from. Um, in this case, the it's a product that really is about industry. And so the power generated by a solar panel is the same quality as the power generated by another solar panel. So there isn't the same kind of branding, I think, advantage that you get in consumer industries. Um, I think that both Germany and China have been more successful at creating the kinds of manufacturing jobs that politicians really want to see as a result of investments in these industries. I do think that there's some downsides to what China has done. I mean, these are, they've been very successful um, in, in making a lot of these panels and, and turbines, but they're also essentially sitting on, on huge amounts of fixed assets, right? And so for instance, with thin foam solar, which didn't work out and didn't end up being cost competitive, they lost a lot of money because they built the factories for technologies that then didn't end up being, um, being successful and so being sort of at the forefront and doing all of the production can help you but it can also be uh, be a hurdle and and can make you lose a lot of money if the technology doesn't work out and these factories can't easily be used for something else so that's sort of a little bit of both um one more thing about this i think i would say is that the discrepancy between what the government has spent and what you get in terms of industrial outcomes is probably the greatest in the united states the us has historically been the largest investor in wind and solar r d going back to the oil crisis and so these billions and billions and billions of government funding haven't yielded here the same industrial footprint that they have in europe and in china where you have you know more manufacturing higher local content uh, than here. And I think that's because we've sort of let these institutions erode that traditionally supported manufacturing in the United States. And I think they were basically gone by the time uh, wind and solar industries came about. And so I think a big frustration and sort of problem for supporting um, wind and solar in the United States is that we have this discrepancy. We've spent a lot of money and we don't have quite the results in manufacturing that uh, we've often promised or that polit politicians have often promised. And so I think that's um, maybe not so much a question of value creation only, but also sort of a, it's a difference between expectations and outcomes that that certainly hasn't played in favor of um, more of this here, which also makes me so excited about this proposal to actually now create a manufacturing bank, because for the first time, we're sort of taking this problem and are trying to solve it, rather than just being upset about it and blaming China for having unfair industrial policies. Excellent. Uh, th th thank you. That's a, that's a very, very thoughtful um, response. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Suyash uh, Jolly. Uh, First of all, asking about slide 17, uh, so we can maybe review that. Uh, to what extent does the varieties of capitalism perspective help us understand the development of onshore wind energy and solar PV in Germany, China, and the US? Your thoughts on that? I can share my screen again. Yeah, let, let's go back to so people know what they're talking about. So this is slide 17. Um, 
That's a very political science question. I gave a job talk once where I was asked that question, didn't have a good response. I've been working on that ever since. Um, basically, uh, what I'm arguing really is the opposite um, of the varieties of capitalism literature, right? So if you think about VOC, the way that they think about institutions is that they're interlocking um, and so they're very difficult to change. And in these systems that are difficult to change, firms are basically constrained in terms of what they can do. And so there's countries that do radical innovation and there's countries to, that do incremental innovation. And that's because of the, the way these institutions are set up and they're, they're very difficult to, difficult to break out of. But it's entire industrial sectors that then live within this institutional setting, right? So industries based on radical innovation live in the US and the UK and industries based on incremental innovation live um, in Germany and other places like that. What I'm arguing here really is that um, firms are the ones that keep these institutions alive. It's not that the institutions are sort of stuck there and, and are limiting firms over time, but that they retain value in new industrial sectors and it's firms themselves that are bringing them into these new industries. And so um, the, the mechanism through which these uh, institutions are kept alive are, fir are firms and not just path dependency and sort of the difficulty of institutional, uh, institutional change. Um, if you can just repeat the offshore part. So now I've sort of like outlined how the institutional setup works, but um, how this institutional landscape would explain offshore. No, um, no, just the onshore wind and PV, so, so your, your basic uh, examples. Well, so basically, you know, you have these different institutional resources in different places. And so they allow firms to specialize in different parts of these supply chains. But it's not that the entire industry would ever sit in one country, but rather that um, and so that's where I sort of differ from the VOC perspective also. You get these little chunks, different nodes in these supply chains that locate in different parts of the world. Um, make use of some of these institutions, but also maybe not all of them. Um, and then, you know, work with others for the things that, um, that you cannot support domestically with the kinds of institutions. And so in some ways, globalization actually has taken away the limitations of this VOC approach. We're no longer so defined by what kinds of institutions we have domestically because we can carve out these different pathways into new industries with the resources that we have available to us. Okay, um, perfect. And uh, another question from, from Suyash is, uh, do you also look at the regional heterogeneity with respect to the development of these industries within uh, the three countries? Um, a little bit. I mean, so I did, um, when I first started my dissertation work, I thought this was going to be a dissertation about central local relations in China and sort of regional variation and what kind of support firms were getting. And I found actually that the sort of support and the types of subsidies, the types of kind of um, you know, government policies at the local level were very similar in provinces um, across the country. And actually, a lot of the firms that, um, that were founded in China were founded purely for reasons, for sort of coincidental reasons. Many people were abroad studying solar PV in Australia, and they basically went back to their hometown to found these companies. And it wasn't sort of a, a system of institutional arbitrage where they were going to places that had better policies than others to support them. So there's some constraints, of course, like if you want to do build a wind industry, you better be in a place where there is some wind. And, you know, so some, you know, geography does matter. But that didn't, in my work, find these huge um, institutional differences in what support was being offered across China and, and sort of these regional clusters of firms actually were often purely coincidental. And so the solar industry just happened to be sort of founded pretty much between Shanghai and Nanjing because that's where a lot of these people were from and they went back home. Um, and the wind industry happened to be in places where they could spin off big uh, state industrial enterprises and had some sort of local training base that allowed them to do that. Um, in Germany, also some regional differences based on where the auto industry was, for instance. A lot of the auto suppliers had skills that were applicable to um, actually both wind and solar. So um, that kind of shaped the geography a little bit, but the institutions that support these are actually national. So there's no sort of big regional difference there. Um, so yes, I think I looked at it, but I didn't find the kind of regional uh, sort of discrepancies. Um, 
that, that I was looking for, which is why it became a global story and not one about domestic differences. Great stuff. Uh, so we still have quite a few questions. So let's, uh, you know, so let's take a kind of short answers to make sure we get through everything and people can follow up later. Okay. So the, next we have uh, uh, Charlie Laurie from uh, Brighton, uh, who's asking about the, the raw materials uh, for, for the industrial manufacturing. So which states and corporations are involved in raw material extraction, export and recycling? Are these also globalized chains or uh, do we need new chains uh, for this? Um, I mean, again, that depends a little bit on what you're looking at, right? So like you need a lot of steel for wind turbines. Um, China is really you know, making a lot of steel for the world. So they sort of have a leg up there. Um, for polysilicon, actually, it has changed over time, which is interesting. The US for the longest time was a sort of export or silicon to the world. And we had the big companies that were making it. And the US actually had a trade surplus with China in that space and the solar industry until uh, exactly around that time during the Obama administration when we started getting into these trade skirmishes with China and actually China at some point um, retaliated against tariffs against Chinese solar panels that we had put in place by putting tariffs on American silicon um, and then grew a domestic silicon industry uh, as a result of that and became kind of independent of these American imports. Um, and so it, it's changed a little bit over over time for, for these industries as a result of these trade uh, trade battles, but it used to be uh, much more collaborative and kind of global. No country was really uh, the one place that, that had a stronghold on all of these raw materials. And then batteries is a whole different story, but that'll take another half hour to explain. We can do that offline. Gotcha. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, Jonas. Uh, next, we have uh, Dei Yu Li, who has, has two questions. The first one is, uh, um, sort of, is there a kind of a technology difference here between solar and wind industry? So, for example, China is less of a global player in wind industry than in solar industry. Um, so, is that because of the technological differences? And then the second question is, what can we learn from wind and solar for other clean tech like green hydrogen or carbon capture and uh, storage? So, I didn't go into a lot of this sort of technical detail, but one of the kind of research design, um, sort of one of the reasons to pick these two industries is because the division of labor globally is actually very similar in these two industries, even though that supply chains and sort of the technologies underlying them are very different. Um, and so, yes, uh, it's much harder to ship wind turbines around the world. And so what we have there is thousands of suppliers and often localized production um, or assembly, at least, in the market where you need it. Solar panels are standardized. They fit into a container. You can make them in China and then basically very cheaply ship them anywhere in the world. Um, maybe not right now, but in, in principle. And so there is a sort of slight difference. But if you look at the components underneath the wind turbine, so like the generator that actually like spins and makes the electricity, the gearbox and so on, um, you see more similarities to the solar industry because that stuff can be shipped around the world. And that's where we see this division of labor play out very clearly in a way that's similar to the, to the solar industry. So, um, you know, China doing sort of the scale up, um, making all of the generators for all of the GE turbines that are being put into the US, um, Germany doing the prototyping, and then American startups kind of developing control software and so on that, that would then run these more efficiently. And so there's actually... Um, despite these technical differences, the division of labor is very, very similar. Got it. Excellent. Um, more um, uh, friends here. So John Helveston uh, is asking about uh, your thoughts on the argument that China's success in lowering costs of current generation solar technologies will undermine investment in the next uh, generation of uh, technology. Is this something that would uh, become an issue? Um, I mean, I, I've had these conversations with John before. I, I struggle with this technology lock-in problem because I think there's sort of this American assumption that new technologies kind of deserve to get into the market, right? And if we think about wind and solar, um, they also had a hard time with these the technologies we currently have, these sort of traditional technologies, they had a hard time breaking into these fossil fuel dominated sectors, right? And the way that they broke in there um, into the technology lock-in that existed in fossil fuel was by Germany basically subsidizing the world's largest solar market for a while and then 
that being the kind of playground on which China could figure out how to make solar cheap. Um, and Greg Nemet has like a wonderful book on, on how that all played out. So now we have next generation technologies that we would like to see break into the market and they can compete with these existing wind and solar technologies. And so if we really think that they are going to give us a huge leg up and eventually will be even cheaper, we need again a huge sort of government intervention for them to break in there. Um, otherwise, that might not work. But so, yes, there is lock-in, but we've also seen it before and we know what we need to do in order to combat it if, if, that, if we really decide that that is a problem, right? There's nothing sort of God-given about new technologies that always means they're um, a game-changer and, and immediately that makes them so cheap that they will outcompete what's already there, especially not in these like highly systemic systems where you have, you know, cables and wires and grids and generators and, you know, there's lots of network effects there that make it much harder. W wonderful. Um, uh, thank you. Next, we have uh, one of our students from the Master of Arts in Sustainable Energy, uh, Leonie uh, Hikita, who's asking about uh, the, the role of uh, low uh, wages in, in, uh, in China in, in, in manufacturing. So um, now that the, the Chinese wages have been rising and continue to rise, do you think that will change this uh, structure of collaboration? I don't think that labor costs really ever were a huge advantage for this. Um, as I said, the Chinese firms struggled to train labor early on. There was so much manufacturing turnover, uh, labor turnover in these plants. Some plants reported something like 20, 30% labor turnover per month. So every three or four months, they had a completely new workforce. And so that became completely unsustainable for, for kind of manual assembly of the stuff. And so very early on, they worked with German firms to fully automate a lot of these production processes. And you can see that as wages have risen more quickly on the coastal side of China, these firms haven't relocated to the interior to kind of chase lower manufacturing wages elsewhere. So I think, um, at this point, it's really about knowledge and innovation and sort of more highly trained uh, R&D teams that are, are making the difference there. And I don't see firms moving around to chase uh, lower manufacturing wages, which also means that in principle, we could be doing this in the US if we wanted to. Um, there may be very little benefit in terms of manufacturing employment in the US as well, because nobody actually works in these plants. Got it. Um, uh, thank you. So we are unfortunately approaching the end of our time. There is still a long list and uh, expanding list of, uh, of, of questions. But let me take one here, which I think is, is quite relevant right now, is uh, from uh, Yun Xiama, who's asking about what about the Biden administration's trade policy? So any thoughts or advice on how to, how to play this? I mean, I think that... The Biden trade policy is essentially so far the Trump trade policy, which is sort of the Obama trade policy, right? So nothing's really changed. I mean, we haven't taken any of these tariffs out. And I think the tariff, have, they've been an incredible failure. I mean, they've made it more expensive to buy these things here. They've for no reason caused this sort of reorganization of the Asian supply chain for solar, where now American destined solar panels are being made in Korea and Malaysia and Taiwan and everything else is still made in China, that's made it more expensive, but hasn't really brought manufacturing back to the US necessarily. So it hasn't sort of led to this resurgence of manufacturing here that we wanted. Instead, it's made solar panels slightly more expensive, um, caused some job losses among the many companies that we do have that install and maintain these solar panels. So the service sector around this has suffered. Um, and it hasn't really kind of changed the outcome in a way. It sort of slowed us down on climate progress. And so, um, you know, I, I, would, I would basically encourage the Biden administration to move, move away from trade as a way of solving this. Um, if you want to win a race, then you need to run faster. So let's figure out what we can do domestically uh, to support more of these activities and maybe different kinds of activities if we're unhappy about the chunk of this division of labor that we ended up with. But just slapping tariffs on panels is, or turbine towers or whatever we've tried in the past has not never really resulted in and sort of manufacturing coming back. And a big part of that is that we don't have any vocational training institutions to train manufacturing workers in these sectors, right? So unless we figure that out, um, it's going to be very hard for people to, uh, to actually bring it here. So I think that's where we need to start with the institutions underneath. 
Excellent. Uh, th th thank you. This has been a very insightful and uh, kind of wide-ranging discussion. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us for this uh, book talk. Uh, do check out the book itself. Uh, there's going to be a lot of additional detail and uh, uh, insight there. So go ahead and, and buy it. Uh, check out the SAIS website at size-icep.org to keep up with us. Uh, you can sub subscribe to our newsletter to learn more about our future research. And uh, thanks for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, in, a, in a few weeks, uh, in, in November, when we talk about China's Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan and Indonesia. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, and thank you, Johannes.